Hi there, thank you for joining me today for part two of a five part message series called Hashtag Struggles. What I decided to do is to make this teaching public instead of limiting it to just those who are on our Zoom course. So hopefully this blesses you, uh, but there's also real benefit in being a part of the course because we, not only do we listen to the, this teaching, but we discuss the teaching and we pray for each other. And there's real power in that. But we're talking about following Jesus in a selfie-centered world. If you missed last week's talk, we talked about a big problem that we have in the social media world, which is the more we compare with others, the less content we are. Next week, part three, and then a couple of weeks after that, part five, I think are my two favorite messages in this whole series. We're going to talk about authenticity because the reality that we have is in the social media driven world that we're tempted to become very filtered in what we show the rest of the world. We filter our pictures, we edit perfectly our little posts to say exactly what we wanted to say and show the parts of our lives that we want you to see. The more filtered that we become, the more difficult it is to be authentic. And I believe next week's message is going to speak to people in a very powerful way. Today, what I want to do is this. I want to talk to you for a little while about intimacy in relationships, because we all know that social media and technology offer so many benefits. We completely embrace it as a church. I love so many different forms of social media and the advantages of technology. We can do so much to minister to other people through technology and social media. It's pretty incredible. But that being said, I'm about to tell you that if you do too much of it uh, and are consumed by it, it can actually hurt your relationships and it can rob you from that which God values the most. We love it, but we have to manage it. And so today I want to talk to you about intimacy in relationships. And I hope you'll hear everything that we talk about through the lens of the words of Jesus in John chapter 13. And let me give you the context of these verses. And then I want you to listen to what we talk about through the lens of the words of Jesus. Right now, Jesus had just washed his disciples feet. And this was a stunning, self-sacrificing, humble move for the son of God to kneel down and to do what was considered the most low and humiliating task, which was to wash the feet of these disciples. Right. He showed incredible love here. Bear in mind that they didn't have fancy Armani shoes like we do today. They wore sandals for the most part on dusty roads. And so this was an incredible thing for Jesus to have done. And then he said to them, he said in verse 34, a new command I give you. And what is this command? Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. He said, as I have loved you, so you must what? You must love one another. By this, Jesus said, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you do what? If you love one another. And what I love about this is not just what he said, but also what he didn't say. Notice he said, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What he didn't say is, they will know that you are my disciples if you have perfect theology. Good theology is so important, yes, but he didn't say, that's how the world will know that you follow me. He didn't say that they will know that you are my disciples if you're always in church. It's a good thing to be in church, but that's not just the only way that they are going to know that you are a follower of Jesus. He didn't say that they will know that you are my disciples if you have a bumper sticker on the back of your car, which quite honestly, some of you should probably not be doing that because they're going to question if you really are disciples of Jesus Christ by the way that you drive, right? They're, they're going to know that we are disciples by the way that we love and the way we treat each other with the sacrificial love of Jesus on the inside of our hearts. They will know that we are disciples by how we love one another. I want you to listen to this message through this lens. And I want to ask you a question. And it's a big question. 
right? How is technology changing our relationships? How is technology impacting and changing our relationships? We know that it's helping a lot in different ways. There are probably some unintended consequences though, unintended negative consequences to technology and relationships. And we want to talk about that, literally hundreds of different ways that it's changing things. But I want to raise three big issues that will really impact our talk today, right? How is technology changing relationships? And the first thing, if you're taking notes, is the term friend is evolving. The term friend is evolving. For example, a friend used to mean somebody that you did life with. We were together doing life. Now a friend can be somebody that you've never really even met in person, that follows you on Facebook. And so the term friend is evolving. For example, the average British Facebook user has about 330 Facebook friends, but the average person in the UK says that they only have two to four close friends. And there's a growing number of people who say they have zero close friends. So the tension here is pretty real. You may have uh, 338 Facebook friends, but we could argue all day long that we've got lots of online activity and yet we may have a very limited personal intimacy. The term friend here is evolving. The second thing, if you're taking notes, is, and this is really interesting to me, is that we're becoming addicted to immediate affirmation. We're becoming addicted to this immediate affirmation. In other words, if I'm feeling a little bit lonely and I want a little bit of affirmation, I, I, I can do, I can go and I can take a, a really quick selfie here and oh, ooh, that wasn't quite right. I'll take another one right here. And then we post it on Instagram. And if I come back a few minutes later, I'll have some likes. I may even have a comment. Right? Oh, Jean or Wilderness J, as I'm known to some, uh, you know, I, I just think you look so good in that with that cap, Jean. Uh, oh, is that a new T-shirt, Jean? Uh, oh, where were you walking? You know, something like I can get some immediate feedback right then and there. And what's happening is we're becoming addicted to this immediate feedback. And in fact, scientists will tell you that it releases a chemical in our brain called dopamine. And we're becoming so addicted to that. You know, what did they say? Uh, did they like it? Who liked it? How many people liked it? W why didn't she like it? She never likes my pictures. I'm not going to like her posts anymore. And we're addicted to this immediate feedback. And what it's doing is it is meeting a short term need, but we're deferring a long term and deeper need. In fact, sociologists now have phrased what they called deferred loneliness. We feel lonely, so we post something, we say something, we get immediate feedback and it meets a short term need, but we're deferring a longing for intimacy into the future. And the loneliness we feel we are deferring to another time. We are living for likes, but we're longing for love. We're hooked on this instant gratification and it's changing the way we do relationships. How is technology changing relationships? The term friend is evolving. We're becoming addicted to immediate affirmation. And number three, perhaps the most important is we have the power to do friendships on our own terms. We have the power to do it on our own terms. In other words, if Richard texts me, I have the choice to read his text, uh, to respond to it, not to respond to it, or to get to it later. I'm in control of what I do and what I do not do, how I respond to his texts. If Sam posts a picture on Instagram, I have the power to determine, is it like worthy or not? Is it worth a double tap of my fingers or do I scroll right past to, a, past to another one of his stupid cat pictures that I'm so sick of him posting all day long? In fact, if he posts another cat picture, I may just unfollow him because why? I'm in total control. I'm in complete control of this friendship. I manage it from a distance. I will show you the part of me I want you to see. I will tell you what I want to tell you. And if I don't want to respond, I'm not going to respond, right? 
And if you post too many pictures of your product or too many duck-faced selfies, you know, I'll unfollow you because I'm in control of this friendship. Suddenly, we wake up and the terms of our friendships have started to change. They've started to shift. And what's really interesting to me is one person said this, the more I use social media, the more I crave personal interaction. Is it true for you? Another person says, I feel more connected than ever before, yet I feel more alone. Do you feel this to be true for you? All I go is click, click, scroll, scroll, click, 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 scroll, scroll, and I'm wanting something more, but I don't have the discipline to stop this, to engage in what I know I really want. I don't know how to get from here to there. What I want to talk to you about today is how do we get from here to there, right? And I want to start with Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25. And the author of Hebrews says this, he says, verse 24, let us think of ways, right? I love this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Wouldn't it be amazing to get together with other followers of Jesus Christ and say, hey, how can we be so purposeful in a, in a way that we show love to each other? Hey, they must be a Christian. Have you seen the way that they love one another? And he goes on to say, let us not neglect our commenting on one another's posts. Uh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. He's I totally messed up there. He says, let us not neglect our what? Say it with me. He says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another as the day draws near. Let us not neglect our meeting together. Some of us need to rediscover the power of practicing presence, of being together with other people. In fact, Jesus said this, he says, wherever two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Whenever we come together with other believers in the name of Jesus, we experience the very presence of Christ in a supernatural way. Now, does that mean that we cannot experience His presence alone? Absolutely not. Of course we can. But there's something special, something pretty powerful when we come together with other believers and we seek God in prayer. We're obviously restricted somewhat right now because of COVID-19. But when we can eventually join hands with others and we can connect our faith together and we can petition the throne of God, we can experience the power and the presence of God in a very real way. There's something that happens when we collectively worship our God and we lift up holy hands to Him with other believers and experience His presence in this way. There's something that happens when we open up God's Word as believers have done for centuries and we read His Word together out aloud with other believers. There's power in presence. Think about it this way. God didn't shout His love from heaven. What did He do? He showed His love on earth. He stripped Himself of all His, of his heavenly glory and He became one of us. God became flesh in the person of Jesus. In fact, Jesus' name, Emmanuel, means God with us. God became one of us in the person of Jesus. What did He do? He lived with us. He loved those that others rejected. He poured His heart into those the religious communities said were not worthy and shunned. He ate with, he dined with, he fellowshiped with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. God didn't shout his love from heaven. He showed his love on earth. And there's something about presence that is just so powerful. And yet so many of us settle for something far less. So what I want to do today is I really want to get practical, right? Just as practical as I can possibly be. And I want to give you two thoughts that are almost offensively simple, but yet are so necessary for our culture today. And if you will apply these, I promise you, I promise you that the Holy Spirit will enter into your relationships and they will be far more than they are today. 
two thoughts if you're taking notes. The first thing is, I want to encourage you to be present. To be present with one another. In fact, let's just do this. Everybody repeat after me, wherever you are right now, repeat after me. I will love people. Come on, let's do this together. I will love people face to face. Even while we're social distancing with our two meter space, not just thumbs to thumbs and click clicks. I will love people face to face, not just thumbs to thumbs, right? Paul said this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. He says, don't just pretend to love others. Let's not just stay at the shallow level. But what we're going to do is, Scripture says, we're going to love them. Love each other with genuine affection, it says, and take delight in honoring each other. When God's people are in need, we're there ready to help them. We're there ready to love people, ready to care for them and to be present in their lives. For example, let me do a little exercise for you. Let's suppose, you know, you've got a friend uh, or a family member and they're hurting right now. They got some bad news, bad medical news, or they didn't get into the school that they wanted to get into, or they might be losing their job, uh, their girlfriend broke up with them, they found out bad news about their husband, or, or whatever the case may be. What's an acceptable way to show love? Acceptable the way most of us would do in our generation, right, is to pound a text out. Hey, I'm thinking about you. Listen, if you're going to text me, don't just think about me. Pray for me. Thinking about you and praying for you, that's an acceptable way. Let's take it up a notch, right? Because we're followers of Jesus and we want others to know that we love them, right? There's another thing we can do. Some of us don't even really remember how to do this, but this is not just something that you type on, right? We can type on it all day long, and that's great. But there's something else we can do with this, right? What else can we do? You can start to talk on it, right? You can go ahead and scroll through your contacts, and you can spiel on someone. And guess what? You can actually talk to them. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, and you can listen to the tone of their voice. And you can not just tell them that you're thinking about them, but you can pray for them. And you can pray for them over the phone. And then you can ask some questions, you know, and have a conversation. And I promise you, you can go to places that a text simply will not go. When you hear the tone of their voice and you invest some kind of time with them. Let's just get crazy, right? Let's just go take it up yet another level, right? We don't just have to, to text. We don't just have to call. But what about another thing that we can do to show love? We can actually go to see them, right? Right now, restrictions are removed to, to some degree. And we can meet with people in the park or, or wherever else. Uh, we can get into our car. We can jump on our scooter and get on our moped and, and you know, whatever, go across town whatever the case may be and we could sit down with them and we could just take a moment meet them in the park or whatever something like that face to face and listen to them and ask them questions and you bring your cup of coffee and I'll bring my cup of coffee and and we can pray we can get a little deeper in conversation I know it seems like it's going to be a long time before we can do this properly, but perhaps you'll, you, you'll be able to one day soon be able to put your hand on somebody's shoulder, right? Or hold hands again and pray with them. If they're crying, you can just wrap your arms around them, right? And hold them. If you're a guy, you can just punch your friend on the shoulder and cheer them up, right? Whatever it would be. But you're right there with them, in it with them. And there's something pretty powerful about being there. There's something powerful about presence. Now, the Jewish community do something pretty amazing. And, and this has really just been an incredible example for me. Something that I've just wanted to learn from. And it's called sitting shiva. And when somebody passes away, right, they, uh, they cover all the, the picture frames and, and, uh, and they cover them all up. But what happens is all your friends and your family, they come to the house and they just sit, right, for seven days. Sitting sevens is what that means. For seven days, they just come into your home and they just sit. 
They don't say much. They don't have to say anything. They don't have to quote Bible verses. They don't have to try and counsel you. They just sit. They just make a cup of tea. And there's something pretty powerful about that. Right? And sometimes we think that we have to have the greatest theology and the greatest advice for our friends that are going through tough times. No, you just presence yourself with them. You just hang out with them. Presence alone is so important, guys. Presence. There's something powerful about that. And we can text. And, and even if you sent the perfect text out there, right, the perfect text would not have meant nearly as much as presence. There's power in presence. And I don't know what it is, but God is relational, right? He created us to love Him and to love one another. And we can love each other from a distance with technology, but we can do so much more face to face. And so I'm looking forward to the day when I can meet some of my friends and some of our South City Church buddies face to face. We can have barbecues again together. Looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to just seeing you guys face to face. So I don't know what that would mean to you, but I, I really want you to think about it for a little while. It might mean that you ask somebody to lunch that you would normally just ch check on uh, via text or phone. Uh, hey, call them up. Hey, let's do lunch sometime. You know, we'll bring our lunches together and we'll meet at the park. You can, you can actually do that, guys. You can sit across from someone and you can just let the conversation go and you can just listen and you can pray and you can laugh and you can tell stories and you can love them. It might mean you do something crazy and in our society today, you know, we wall people out. And, you know, in some parts of the world, you've made it if you live in an exclusive uh, walled community, right? A gated community. And maybe you'll be more like Christ and you'll let people in. You'll invite people when we can into your home, right? And you'll make dinner for them. And if you cannot cook, you can order takeout. But we'll sit across a table with someone and there's something holy about breaking bread together with other people. And it might be you invest in someone who's younger, who needs mentoring. It might be that you invite somebody you, you know uh, that nobody's going to invite. You look out for those that are lonely. Some of you right now, you're longing for something more spiritually. And I'll tell you what you're missing, right? I'll tell you exactly what you're missing. You're missing the joy and the blessing of Christian community because you're not in Christian community right now. You don't go to church and you aren't in a connect group, a small group of people that you're doing life together with, right? You're not opening up God's word with other people. You're not doing life together and you're not encouraging one another. And even though my connect group, we, don't, we cannot meet face to face right now. We meet every week as often as we can uh, via Zoom and we're interacting with each other. We're checking up on each other. We're, you know, we've had our, you know, our drink and whatever, a snack, and we've conversed with one another via Zoom. It's still possible, but when we can, we can go deeper. Does it get messy? Oh, absolutely it gets messy. It certainly does. You can control it and you can keep it clean from a distance, but the risk is worth the reward when you open up your heart. And we call it Connect Group in our church, where we do life together uh, because life is better together. I don't know how this will apply for you, but I really pray that if the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you, that you will intentionally take a step forward and be present with those around you, right? Number one, be present with those around you. And number two, if you're taking notes, uh, and I want to encourage you here, be engaged. This is so important. Be engaged. Don't just physically be present, but be emotionally completely engaged and present, right? In fact, Peter said this. He says, most important of all, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, if you're following with me, continue to show what? Let's say it out aloud. Continue to show deep love for one another. That's a deep spiritual engagement where we're all in it, right? 
where the person in the room is the most important person for us at that moment, right? Think about this. I guarantee you, all of you have seen this, right? You may have even done this yourself. You go to a restaurant today and you look around and what do you see? You see a family of four people uh, sitting or five and they're all sitting together and they're having a nice meal together and what are they doing? All of them, the older ones are doing this and the younger ones are doing this, right? And what are they doing? Everybody's on their phones and they might pick you know have a glance up at, at somebody that's across the table for them but then they're checking out their Instagram and they're checking out their Facebook and they're doing all sorts of you know texting or whatever it may be and I've seen it in my own house I have a teenage daughter and sometimes she's invited her friends over before lockdown and they're so excited and all these teenage girls and they're sitting on the sofa and what are they doing Right? They've come together uh, here to be together, but they're all alone together on their phones. Right? Parents, moms, dads, you've done this, right? Your children are begging for your attention. Mom, mommy, 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 look at my drawing. Mommy, mommy. But you're too busy. You're too busy. I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. What are you doing? You're searching, f uh, you know, Facebook for mermaid yoga. I don't know, mermaid yoga for beginners. Uh, thinking that this is going to change your life and they're begging for your attention to be engaged with them. Think about how incredibly rude it would be if we're having coffee with one of our friends and we're engaged in a conversation, right? And they're pouring out their heart to you and you reach into your backpack and you pull out a book and you read two chapters uh, and then you put the book down and then you resume your conversation with this person, right? And then they start getting a little deeper and then you're like, uh, you know, hang on just one second, right? And, and then you get your little notebook and you write down, okay, I need to pick this up from the store and I need to collect this okay all right I'm with you now okay carry on and then we, they're talking and they're opening up their heart and then you see somebody that you know and you quickly hang on one moment and you go and chat to that person for five seconds and then you come back and you're like sorry I'm with you now they would think man what a silly person this is right but what we do is we do exactly we're face to face with someone that matters to us a whole lot and what are we doing well this right be engaged. And here's the problem, right? Every time that this thing buzzes, this thing whistles, this thing chirps and beeps, there's something that's going on on the inside of us, right? Who said something? What is it? Uh, you know, what do I need to know? What am I missing out on? In fact, there's a new word that's just hit the, the dictionary, right? And it's called FOMO. F-O-M-O. And it stands for fear of missing out. And there's a generation that is just, what am I missing out on, right? What am I going to miss if I'm going to have a conversation with this person? What am I going to miss if I'm not looking at this? I might miss somebody's silly cat pictures. I might miss somebody saying, oh, you're looking pretty fab. Now, I might miss somebody saying, you look gorgeous. Hashtag cool lingo. Right, I might miss somebody uh, liking my picture. Did they like it? Did they uh, comment? Did they give me a thumbs up and things like that? Listen to me, at the end of your life, you're not gonna be sitting around going, if only I'd had three more likes. If I'd only just had 300 people who are following me. If only I had triple digits like that person. Oh, then life would be so amazing. It's not going to matter how many likes you've got, but it's all going to be about how much love you showed and how much love you received, right? That's how the people will know that you are a follower of Jesus by the way that you love one another. Your children are begging you for your attention. Parents, they're begging for your attention. They're acting out, trying to get your attention. And some of you say, well, well, they're doing the same thing. Yes, maybe they are. But it's your job as parents to engage with them in such a way that there's something meaningful that comes out of it, right? Let me tell you something. You may be afraid of missing out on what somebody says here, but you should actually be more afraid of missing out on the person that's right in front of you right that's what you're missing out on you're missing out some of you on your children growing up they're right there but you're you've got your face in a screen and 
you should really be afraid of missing out on what matters the most. And so I don't know how you apply this and, and maybe it's time for you to perhaps set some social media rules or technology rules. I don't know, that's up to you, right? Maybe the phone goes down at 10 o'clock at night the phone goes on the docking station during dinner time or when we're meeting with people the face goes face down uh, connect group face down listen to me if you're in bed with your spouse and you're both on your phones and you're tempted to text each other and ask hey uh, are you in the mood and, and the reason we laugh at this because it's happening you know this is very close to the truth right she responds hashtag headache then you're done 1st John chapter uh, 3 verse 18 and let me help you out here dear children let us not merely say that we love each other let us what does it say let us show the truth by our actions don't just pray for them right pray with them don't just like what they post like who they are get involved in their lives this was the greatest weapon of the first century followers of Jesus. They were so persecuted by the outside force that they loved each other with this radical, unifying love. And if anybody had a need, you know what they did? They would take from their own possessions and they would sell it and they would take the money and they would use it to meet the other person's need in their community who was in need. In fact, the scripture says that they were so generous and so loving that there were no needy persons among them. That's pretty amazing. And the skeptical world looked on and they're like, I'm not sure about this whole Jesus thing uh, and this Jesus thing being raised from the dead. I'm not sure I believe what they believe, but I want to have what they have. They love each other and they care for each other. And that's pretty amazing. And Jesus said this way, they will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. They will know that you are my disciples, not by how many followers you have and how many likes you get. And and how fast you respond to your email they will know and sense your love when you get involved in their lives and you care for them and you open up your heart and you do life with them and they will see something that they really want and when they ask you what it is you can say man I'm on a mission from God who gave his son for me to forgive me of my sins and and I have found freedom in that and that's what I want to show you right and the reason why I preach this with such great passion today is because I'm sick of my own inability to control this. I refuse to be mastered by this or by anything. I want to live my life longing to love people, not longing for likes the whole time I'm with them, right? I'm longing for more love. I refuse to be a slave to a screen. I'm going to be a lover of people. And yes, I will leverage technology all day long. I will use it to be a blessing to others but I will not let it replace the intimacy and the power uh, of face-to-face -face relationships because when God showed us his love he didn't just shout it out from he the heavens he showed it on earth God became flesh in person God was with us I want you to take a moment and I want to pray for many of you. You're going to recognize that this might be a problem in your own life. It may be a very big problem for some of you. And certainly it's a problem for somebody that's close to you, right? If it's not a big problem for you, you know somebody. And if you recognize that this is impacting your relationships, sometimes it's positive, but oftentimes it's just negative. You want God to bring some freedom there in your life and to take away the negativity of it. You want something better. You want to enjoy the blessing of social media and technology, but you never want it to replace the blessing of face-to-face -face intimacy and you're honest and you recognize that this is an issue, uh, I want you to pray right now. Ask God for help to manage it wisely and never settle for anything less than His best. If that's you today, would you be really, really honest right now? Let's not just hear this and move on, right? But let's really be doers of this. And if we're really honest and say, yes, this is an issue for me, won't you pray with me just for a moment?
God, I thank you for those who are open to what you're saying. God, give us wisdom as we discuss it and as we pray for each other. Lord, give us love and grace as there are conversations between husbands and wives, between parents and children, and between friends. God, for those who are lacking true, genuine, spiritual community right now, I pray that at this moment you would nudge their hearts to take that step. Lord, that they would decide in their hearts that no more will they do life on their own, but life is better together. I need other believers uh, in my life. I want to be in community where I can truly open up and I could show love to somebody else and then be loved by that person and be known in a, a deeper way. God, as followers of Jesus, I pray that we would be moved to engage in the lives of people, not just online, but deeply engaged in their lives and that the world would look on and say, wow, wow, just simply wow those must be followers of Jesus those must be Jesus people I know it because of the way that they love Lord help us today help us to be bold help us to be determined to do life differently to do life your way in Jesus name amen and so I want to thank you for uh, just taking this time to listen to this message. If you need support, if you need prayer, if you need somebody to chat to, won't you get a hold of me? Uh, I'd love to support you. I'd love to pray with you. Um, I'd love to just spend some time perhaps working through these issues with you. God bless you. Thank you so much.